For decades now, the majority of spaceflight enthusiasts have lived under the assumption that this is the only way that we're going to get to Mars. No, not Starship in particular, but chemical rockets. This is the only type of propulsion that we realistically have at our disposal, at least in the near future, that's going to be capable of transporting us to the Red Planet. And even though this is not the fastest way to accomplish these sorts of things, and we even have other types of propulsion today, such as ion engines that can propel small satellites and probes to interplanetary destinations much faster and far more efficiently when it comes to transporting large amounts of cargo or human beings, chemical rockets are still the only way to go, which is why we have the Raptor 2 and so much work being done on it and the BE-4 and other types of propulsion that are maximizing the output of chemical rockets simply because we are reaching the upper limit of what these things are capable of. But is this really the case? Well, obviously, I've put out quite a lot of material as of late about things like nuclear thermal propulsion and the amount of progress we're making on that and it seems very realistic that we are going to have a functional prototype by the middle of this decade and a fully functional nuclear thermal thruster by the end of this decade. It's entirely possible that NASA intends to use this type of propulsion to get us to Mars in three months rather than six, which has all kinds of advantages. But what about fusion. Well, in early February, as many of you have probably heard, just about every news agency announced that a major breakthrough had been made at the UK-based Jet Laboratory, which is part of the ITER project, that is to say the biggest international project to make fusion into a practical form of power. And what it accomplished was tremendous. 59 megajoules worth of energy over five seconds. 11 megawatts worth of power in five seconds. It was an amazing accomplishment, more than double what was accomplished back in 1997, which was the last time that we were told that fusion was just around the corner. However, my daughter is actually part of this project now, believe it or not, in a very small way through the ITER project, and I'll explain that a little bit later, but I am convinced, and I think so is she, that we are very close to having a practical fusion, perhaps within the next 10 or 20 years, about the time that we intend to go to Mars. So what sort of results could we get out of this? How much of a difference would a fusion-powered starship make in terms of transportation time, in terms of efficiency, in terms of other benefits? Well, the difference is dramatic. There are many ways to take advantage of fusion and to use it to get to other planets, but I'm going to talk about one in particular called a plasma thruster in just a moment. This is Dr. Fatima Ebrahimi, and I may be mispronouncing that. If so, I apologize profusely. However, I just wanted to make sure that all of you knew where this idea was coming from. This young lady has been working on nuclear fusion for a considerable amount of time. However, it was her that came up with the idea that a byproduct of nuclear fusion could actually create direct thrust. First of all, let's try to understand 
understand fusion, at least as they're trying to work on it right now. Most experiments with nuclear fusion involve combining two different types of hydrogen atoms, one called deuterium and the other called tritium, combining it into a helium atom with a neutron also as a byproduct, which means you get a lot of neutron radiation. The whole notion that fusion creates power without radioactive byproducts is actually not true unless you're using helium-3. If you can do that, then you can do it without a great deal of neutron radiation. However, we'll get to that in a bit. What they're looking to do, of course, is to harness the energy of the sun. Nuclear fusion is, of course, what powers our star, what powers virtually every star in the universe, and it creates, of course, an enormous amount of energy. Only matter-antimatter mutual annihilation might be able to produce a lot more energy. But one of the byproducts of our sun is something called coronal mass ejections, and one of those just happened in front of you right there, where an enormous amount of material is ejected from the surface of the sun as a byproduct of the fusion reaction. And this material actually follows magnetic field lines that twist and strain under the magnetic energy until ultimately they snap, something that you see quite frequently anytime that you watch any sort of image that involves a coronal mass ejection. And what the idea of a plasma thruster is, is to create many coronal mass ejections going off every few milliseconds in the engine instead of a steady stream of accelerated particles. These are actually called bubbles of plasma or plasmoids. And these plasmoids can travel up to 500 kilometers per second, which is much, much faster than traditional rocket thrust. Now let's just make a quick comparison here. The RS-25 engine, which is one of the most efficient rocket engines that's ever been built, capable of a specific impulse of 453 seconds and exhaust speeds of 4.4 kilometers per second, is one of the best rocket engines that's ever been built. Obviously the Raptor has certain advantages, but it doesn't have a specific impulse of 453 seconds. It it's almost 100 seconds less than that. And yet, listen to the comparison between this engine and what's possible with a plasma thruster, or rather, a simulated plasma thruster. The simulated plasma thruster generates, as I said before, exhaust speeds of up to 500 kilometers per second, so 100 times as fast, and a specific impulse of 50,000 seconds. Now, just to be clear, the plasma thruster is not using the material used to generate the fusion reaction as propellant. It instead uses whatever type of gas you put into the fusion reaction, and that gets converted into plasma, and that in turn gets put out the nozzle of the rocket, utilizing magnetic field lines that generated by the fusion reaction in the first place. You don't need to generate generate your own electromagnetic field coil in order to make this work. Instead, it has its own electromagnetic lines that makes the whole thing function. So that being the case, you can put just about any type of gas you want to into this, whereas traditional ion engines have to use gas like xenon in order to ionize it and create thrust, whereas this would be able to ionize just about anything, hydrogen, helium, etc. and use it as propellant, which means you could refuel it using it in situ resources easily found anywhere in the solar system. This is essentially a fusion drive at its simplest. It uses spontaneously generated propellant, in other words, the plasmoids that are created simply by injecting just about any type of gas you want to into the fusion reaction, and then the spontaneously generated magnetic field lines accelerates the ionized plasma out the nozzle. So you don't really need to manipulate this thing very much. It kind of provides the thrust on its own. And as I said, a specific impulse of up to 50,000 seconds. 
Now, it wouldn't produce as many Newtons as a traditional rocket engine. But nevertheless, if we're talking about how much of a difference this would make in terms of Earth to Mars, we're looking at a minimum increase of five to six fold. So you're looking at four weeks instead of six months. Now, as I mentioned before, a deuterium and tritium fusion reaction would produce a considerable amount of neutron radiation. That's one of the things that my daughter was working on, actually, over last summer. And this was a machine oil that would be used in the fusion reactor. They were essentially comparing various, various types of machine oils to see how many of them would stand up under continuous exposure to neutron radiation radiation. So she was essentially bombarding various types of machine oil with radioactive isotopes and seeing which one would work the best. It was an interesting project to say the least. Plus, I get to say that my daughter was actually working on this exciting project. But that having been said, this is not based on any kind of theoretical principles. These plasmoids have actually been observed and not just coming out from the sun, but rather as a byproduct of our own fusion reactions here on Earth. Dr. Ibrahimi, she observed these things happening at the NSTX fusion reactor at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. So, and by the way, that's part of the ETIR project as well. So this is not science fiction. This is not something far removed from our current technology. Granted, it does require that we build a functional and practical fusion reactor, which is still beyond us at the moment, but the current objective of ITER is to generate a sustained fusion reaction that produces 500 megawatts worth of energy, which is enough to power a city, by 2035. If that can be done, then this sort of thruster is well within our technological capabilities. Granted, it is going to require some radiation shielding, but that would be involved with any type of nuclear reaction, certainly within our capabilities. So when it comes right down to it, the prospect of getting to Mars in just a few weeks, as opposed to six months, is well within our technological capabilities, at least within the next couple of decades. That is a very exciting prospect for a lot of different reasons. First of all, you can change your mission configuration entirely. If it only takes four Four weeks to get to Mars as opposed to six months. That means that you can go to Mars, stay there for four months, and come back rather than having to stay in a microgravity environment for a year and one third gravity for two years. This would allow us to study the effects of microgravity and one third gravity on our astronauts under a much more controlled situation than exposing it to them to it for three years if we're using chemical rockets. Now, like just about any type of nuclear propulsion, this cannot be used to take off, obviously. You still need chemical rockets in order to escape the Earth's gravity or escape Mars' gravity as far as that's concerned. So chemical rockets are still going to have a very important part to play. The fusion reaction, or a nuclear thermal thruster for that matter, is all going to have to happen in space on the upper stage of whatever rocket that we use, or if we simply build an interplanetary rocket or interplanetary spacecraft, all of the fusion or fission reactions are going to have to happen out in space. But nevertheless, the more you cut down the transit times, the more accessible the solar system becomes. Also, the less likely your astronauts are going to be involved in some sort of massive solar storm or coronal mass ejection that could expose them to lethal doses of radiation. The less time our astronauts have to spend in microgravity and the less time they have to spend exposed to cosmic rays, the better. The quicker we can get them to Mars, where they at least have some protection from Mars' atmosphere, and the thin atmosphere of Mars provides a lot more protection from radiation than we ever thought, the better it's going to be for human beings who decide to make this epic trip, but it goes far beyond Mars. 
If you plug in the capabilities of the plasma thruster into a 100-ton spacecraft and send it off to Jupiter, it can reach its destination in 242 days, assuming that you're looking at the closest approach of Jupiter to Earth. 242 days from Earth to Jupiter. Not a whole lot more, really, than we're looking at right now to get from Earth to Mars, which is 180 days. So we're looking at putting the Jovian worlds within our grasp. Of course, going to Jupiter, a manned mission to Jupiter, would seem a bit suicidal because Jupiter puts out a tremendous amount of electromagnetic radiation. It has an electromagnetic field that puts ours to shame. However, it's not an electromagnetic field that goes out forever. Even though the moons of Io and Europa are are bathed in a tremendous amount of radiation that would rapidly prove lethal to our astronauts. If we're talking about Ganymede and Callisto, these are realistic places to set up colonies. They are not bombarded by nearly as much radiation, plus they are tidally locked, so only one hemisphere faces Jupiter at any given time. That being the case, different parts of the moons receive different amounts of radiation. Radiation. The leading edge of these moons receives considerably less radiation than the trailing edge. Now, granted, the entire moons are still subjected to some radiation simply because Jupiter's magnetic field essentially encompasses the entire moon, but nevertheless, it's substantially less than if you're looking at trying to go to Europa or Io. Io, of course, would be crazy dangerous because of its volcanoes anyway. And then if you're talking about going out to Titan, things are just as optimistic. The distance from Jupiter to Saturn and therefore to Titan is roughly the same as the distance from Earth to Jupiter. So you're looking at the same transit time planet hopping, so to speak, from Jupiter out to Saturn. Titan is arguably the best place in the solar system for us to set up a colony simply because of its atmosphere. Its atmosphere gives it complete protection from radiation and cosmic rays. Yes, it's incredibly cold there, but you wouldn't need pressure suits like you would need on Mars or just about any place else. Instead, you would simply need insulating clothing and respirators not full-fledged EVA suits, and there's no place else in the solar system, aside maybe from the upper atmosphere of Venus, that can really say that. Not only that, housing could be made of plastic that's produced from the unlimited resources harvested on the surface, and could consist of domes inflated by warm oxygen and nitrogen. All of these things can be found in vast quantities on Titan, because because of the hydrocarbons that exist in solid and liquid form that could be used, as I said, for plastics and also for sources of energy. The atmosphere does lack oxygen, yes, but there's water ice just below the surface that could be used to provide oxygen for breathing and to combust hydrocarbons as fuel. And perhaps even more exciting is the prospect of life on Titan in two different varieties, both typical life, which would exist beneath the surface of the ice in an ocean tip similar to what exists on Europa, for example, but also methanogenic life on the surface. Analyses of Titan's atmosphere, and one day I'll put out another video about this topic, which predicted the existence of methanogenic life and the bio products that it would give off turned out to be positive when examined by the Cassini probe. There are strong indications that methanogenic life exists on Titan in addition to life beneath its surface. What an amazing prospect for astronauts in the future, but it's not possible to go this far out into the solar system with chemical rockets in anything resembling a reasonable amount of time. You need superior proportion 
propulsion, better even than nuclear thermal, and this plasma thruster and the fusion power that goes with it may be the answer to exploring the solar system. Proponents of fusion power like to talk about how this new form of energy is going to be our salvation, producing enormous amounts of energy without having to mine the surface of the planet for any sort of rare materials. All you need is hydrogen in various forms, or perhaps helium-3, and I may make a video about that as well, which produces fusion power without a great deal of neutron radiation, but that can only be found in great quantities on the moon. And that's part of my point. If we want to preserve the future of this planet and its environment, it's in our interest to expand out into the solar system, and not just to Mars, but out to the Jovian worlds as well. And to do that, we're going to need a new type of propulsion, a faster type of propulsion. And this is something we can definitely undertake if we simply invest the necessary resources, talent, and money in the project. Please subscribe to my channel if you like to hear about new ways for us to explore and colonize our solar system. And also, if you wish to support me in other ways, there are ways to do it in the description. So until we invest what is necessary to produce a new type of propulsion that will carry us throughout the solar system and create a truly multi-planetary civilization in the process, I urge all of you to stay angry about space!